I'm uh, Mike Lignatiev, Rector and President of CEU. I'm speaking to you from Vienna. Uh, I want to welcome faculty, staff, students, alumni, friends of CEU around the world. I see some of you on the call already. Welcome. Uh, I want to welcome you to this panel on the future of the university in a post-pandemic world. We have four trustees, each of whom are running great institutions in the thick of this pandemic. And our focus tonight will be on three questions. What we've learned as university leaders from the pandemic experience. Secondly, how have our institutions responded to the pandemic? That is, how have we tried to contribute to research, vaccines, knowledge to get us out of this terrible experience? And third, above all, how we think the pandemic will change higher education in the years ahead. So those are the questions that we want to focus on for the next 90 minutes. Um, just a little housekeeping before we get to it. This event is being recorded. Uh, an edited version will appear on our website. Uh, if you haven't already done so, please mute your microphone so we can maintain good sound quality. But please get ready once the discussion with our panelists concludes to use the chat function on Zoom to put your questions. Don't do your questions now, wait till the end of the session and then put uh, questions on the chat uh, function and we will take as many as we possibly. Okay. I would like to uh, be able to have um, a half an hour of questions if we can. Uh, so we'll have a discussion for the first hour and then go to questions. The event will close sharply at 7.30 Central European time um, and whatever that time is in your particular time zone. Let me introduce the panel, which is extremely distinguished. I'm going to do this introducing them by time zone so that you can appreciate just what an extraordinarily global event this is. First of all, I want to welcome Carol Christ. Carol is in Berkeley, California, where it's nine o'clock in the morning. She is the chancellor of Berkeley. She's a former president of Smith and a very distinguished scholar of Victorian literature. Uh, Leon Botstein is in upstate New York where it is noon. He's the president of Bard and the longest serving college president in the United States. He's also a distinguished musicologist and conductor and he happens to be the chairman of CU's board of trustees. The third person on our panel is Louise Richardson She's in Oxford, England, where it is about 5 p.m. She's the vice chancellor of Oxford University. She's a distinguished political scientist. She's a former colleague of mine at Harvard University. And she's been a driving force in working with scientists who developed the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. And her work has been concerned to ensure that the vaccine is available uh, to the developing world and that revenues from the vaccine will support vaccine and epidemiological research at Oxford and elsewhere. And finally, we have Edeltraud Hanapi Egger, who's in Vienna, Austria, where it is 6 p.m. She's the rector of WU, the Wirtschaft Universität. She's a computer scientist by training and an expert on gender and diversity in organizations. And as for me, uh, I'm in Vienna. Uh, let's get started. I, I'd like to each of you to tell us what the pandemic has done to your institutions and what you as a leader of that institution have learned from the experience. And I thought I would um, start with you, Carol, and then work across the time zones. Carol, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Michael. I, I what the uh, uh, pandemic has done to Berkeley is I think what it's done every place. We are, um, uh, except for our scientists working in laboratories, we are um, uh, totally remote. Um, it's taught me an enormous amount. First of all, I've had to learn how to make uh, decisions in a context of great uncertainty where the facts are changing. You have to both be decisive, but also be willing to, um, to change course if, um, if the situation changes. Uh, one of the lessons that I, um, I've learned is uh, the importance of communication. 
I feel in these circumstances, you can't over communicate among your leadership team to your many constituencies. So we spend a lot of time communicating. Uh, the student experience has been fascinating to me. Uh, the change to remote learning happened much more easily and successfully than I thought it would. The faculty have been enormously creative in curriculum design. What's been very hard for the students has been uh, their social experience. They feel isolated. We see rising uh, levels of, um, of anxiety, depression, uh, and, um, and the pandemic has been a huge inequality amplifier. Uh, some students have all the conditions um, of, for successful remote learning, uh, a, a comfortable and, and, and quiet place to study, good broadband uh, connectivity, and others have um, siblings to care for, uh, very poor um, uh, connectivity, um, sometimes parents sick or out of work. So the inequalities that are so much a part of our system seem to be amplified by the pandemic. And then finally, I would say what I've learned is resilience uh, that um, I've been, a few years ago, I did um, an essay on, um, on dystopian fiction. Uh, dystopian novels always end badly. Um, things always devolve into a kind of Lord of the Flies situation. And that's not been my experience. I've seen incredible um, both resilience and even heroism on the part of many of our faculty, uh, staff and students as we all work uh, to, uh, to try to um, meet the challenge of the multiple crises that we're dealing with currently. Thank you, Carol. I'm sure we're gonna to want to look again and again at the inequality amplifier uh, effects of this pandemic, which seems that's a key point you've made among many others. I'm wondering whether we can go to Leon, uh, Leon Botstein next, just for some thoughts about uh, what the pandemic has done to Bard and what you have learned from it as a university leader. Thank you, Michael. And uh, I want to second uh, very much of uh, what Carol just said. Um, sort of add that to that um, um, very fine summary of, of the impact. Uh, there's the impact of isolation, that, uh, that learning that we've discovered as we scramble uh, in this circumstance is really a, a significantly uh, a human experience um, in real time, in real space, with other students and with faculty, that um, before the pandemic began, there was a fair amount of um, utopian nonsense, uh, Carol said dystopian, but we were overwhelmed with, we, we are horse and buggy, we're out of date, the university, you know, from the 12th century on, we're, you know, we're, we're doing stuff without any recognition of change. And now we uh, were... Uh, um, found ourselves in an emergency situation where we had to rely on technology. And the good news is that we've learned a lot from this technology. I think from this pandemic, uh, the way we teach when the pandemic is under control will be fundamentally different. We'll use the technology in different ways than we had thought before. But we did learn is that um, teaching in real time and creating the relationships between and among students, Carol speaks about the isolation of students and the inequality. Um, that is e exceptionally true. Uh, we run, happen to run eight uh, high schools, high school early colleges in six cities, uh, urban centers in the United States, and the inequality there in the public systems is staggering. Uh, we've tried to help in some cases in Baltimore and in Washington, but it is a staggering. So there's a tremendous loss, especially in the United States, whose secondary and elementary systems are very poor, um, a tremendous loss that this has happened because this online alternative is not nearly as good as what Carol describes. And she's correct in saying, uh, I've been unbelievably um, gratified by the response of faculty. You know, um, one would think of them as very conservative, uh, but they've adapted terrifically. And uh, uh, the other thing, of course, is that uh, on the more slightly humorous side is that the um, 
the concept of time has been changed. There seem to be no limits to the day. Five o'clock is irrelevant, nine o'clock is irrelevant, four o'clock in the morning is irrelevant. Everybody can get in touch with everyone else at any time. And there's a kind of weird uh, sameness that has descended. And that's not altogether great for intellectual and scientific work. Now, a lot of the stuff that we do well is in fact, chit chat is inefficient, is meeting people, is, uh, and that's true of students as well. Um, in our case, the very severely um, heard have been the arts, the performing arts, dance, theater, music, um, which really there is no technological alternative. And, uh, and there, the sort of public space, what worries me, of course, about the pandemic is that when we come back, uh, we don't go back to normal, we do something better, uh, not in our political life, but in our artistic life and in general, um, in the way we run our universities. That the social development, Carol mentioned, that the sort of character development of people as they are members of a university community, that has been lost to some great degree. And I think that's a loss we have to think about how to make it uh, better. Uh, but I think that um, uh, it is really, um, uh, reminds us of how much better we could do what, than what we used to be doing. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Leon. We've, we've um, fronted this issue of inequality. Uh, we've also, I think, brought into focus the enormous cost that this has been to the community functions of learning and the ways in which learning is indissociable from a physical community presence. Those are two issues that come out very clearly already. I, I wanted to go to um, Louise in, in Oxford and just ask her the same question. I mean, what's it been like for you and what have you learned? Perhaps what surprised you as well? Thank you, Michael. Um, well, again, I would echo so much of what Carol said about the importance of resilience, of communication, of uh, just acceptance of uh, uncertainty and all that that implies for decision making. And, and of course, the point, fundamental point she made about uh, um, amplifying inequality, although I'd, I'd mention another kind of inequality too, which is the inequality of impact on our staff. So at the moment, our schools are closed here in the UK. So some of our staff are homeschooling while trying to do their jobs, uh, which is enormously difficult if you have young kids. Other members of staff are, are living completely alone. And as one of them said to me, I haven't touched a human being in almost a year. And so um, we as leaders of these institutions, I think have to encourage compassion amongst uh, all the members of the community and realize that uh, everybody's grappling with this in different ways. We shouldn't rush to judgment and some people are not those who appear to have it easy, like those without kids, um, are not necessarily having an easy time. But other things I learned or appreciated is there's no, um, it's not a coincidence that institutions like ours have lasted this long. And we have, because we've been adaptable, we've been through, we've been through plagues and civil wars and all the rest of it over the centuries. Uh, we're old hands of plagues in Oxford. We've had lots of them. Um, <laughs> And in the past, uh, we did all the same things. We had uh, social distancing, uh, co face coverings. Um, the only two differences that I can establish, even during the worst of the plagues um, in the 16th century, uh, they still kept the churches open, uh, but they, they killed all the dogs and cats uh, because they blamed them. So uh, we've closed the churches, but protected the dogs and cats. But within the actual teaching itself, at the beginning of this, we thought, well, lectures will be fine online and tutorials, which are the holy grail for us, they're really going to suffer. And it didn't turn out that way. In fact, a one-on-one -on -one session online actually can work really very well. So the tutorial system has been sustained during this. On the other hand, lectures have been not very satisfactory for people at all. I mean, they've been satisfactory for the students because they can record them and consult them but not for the lecturer because you're getting nothing back from the room. So the lectures as we're doing them uh, are not as uh, satisfying as, as we expected they would be. And we've been in three different types of lockdown. Uh, we're in lockdown number three and we've had three semesters. The first semester Trinity term, we moved everything online 
and completely shocked ourselves by the speed with which we were able to do that. Last term, we actually had everybody back. In fact, the largest cohort ever. And we taught partly online, partly, partly in person. This term, again, it's changed and we're allowed to have small numbers back. Um, so each time we're, we're simply adapting. And in this big diverse institution with you know, 44 different colleges, we have managed all to stay united around a, a common purpose. Again, more effectively than I would have believed possible. And I think that's because of the commitment of our faculty that Leon and, and Carol have, have spoken to. But I would say this time out, I'm certainly detecting people are altogether more exhausted, more wrung out, more fraught than they have been until now. I, I think people expected this to be over by now and they're finding it very, very difficult. And I think we as leaders of these institutions have to adapt our expectations of people and to recognize that reality. So with that, let me stop for, for now. Thank you, Louise. I think we'll all remember that remark about a member of your staff who said to you that she hadn't or he hadn't um, had a single physical contact with another human being in a, in a year. I think there are quite a few of these members of our community and we need to remember it. Um, in Vienna, we're in the same situation. We're in, I think, the second lockdown or the third lockdown with no end in sight. Um, uh, I think Carol made the point that one of the stresses on all our institutions is just the simple uncertainty, the regulatory uncertainty, the rules keep changing. Um, and I think that's a big factor. I wanted to bring in Edeltraud, uh, Hanna Pieger, um, my colleague and friend from Vienna. I'm just wondering, Edeltraud, whether you can talk to us a little bit about uh, uh, what the pandemic has done to WU, big public university uh, in downtown Vienna, and um, what you as a leader of the institution have learned from the experience, Edeltraud. Well, thank you very much for having me here. Sorry that I have been a little, a few minutes late, but um, probably this is one, one thing we learned dealing with technical problems, right? With, with, with uh, switching everything to online and we have to come up with some, some new solutions. Well, actually, yeah, we went on distance uh, very quickly. So within a few days, we had to bring 2,300 people to home office and more than 1,700 courses uh, online, which was a huge effort for all of our faculty um, and staff. And um, it was um, a kind of a strange situation because we, we were facing these very new things we have to do. And at the same time, it was kind of energizing. So people really were willing to do this extra mile and um, to, to be highly committed to the fact that we really wanted the university not to shut down, but to go on in the online uh, style. And therefore, there was a, a, a really very strong effort for all, of all people uh, to make this happen without um, trying to cancel any exams or cancel any courses or whatsoever. However, what became visible very soon for us was that uh, not only the students, but also the faculty, they, they need different kinds of support. So first we figured out that they need professional support. This is trainings. So we had, of course, our tools put in place, but uh, we had to, to, to train them how to use them um, in, in, you know, with all the features they have and how to deal with this new concept. So just not, you know, the shift in the online world, but really to rethink the concept and the way of teaching. Also our staff. So we needed, uh, we offered them trainings, leadership in the online world. How can I, what, what does this still mean? How can I keep contact to our, to our um, colleagues. We also had um, kind of, you know, the sort of professional, but then it was very clear very soon that they need social support in terms of communication. Um, so um, we, in, we, we, we established several ways of communicating with our people, not only, uh, you know, within the small teams, but for instance, we had a monthly town hall, online town hall meeting where, where, where we invited all people 
to, to participate and actually they did. So there were hundreds of people in the town hall meetings, putting their questions, getting um, information, but also just, I think they also needed a kind of, you know, connection to the leadership and connection to the managers so that we are there for them, that we are thinking over the things, we're trying out and so on and so on. And the third area uh, of, in which they needed support was psychological. So we had those burnout syndromes, not only in, uh, not only the students, but also with faculty members. In particular, actually those with, um, uh, with kids. So because also it was homeschooling set up, all those people who had kids, they really were exhausted. And they told us, we can't, we can't switch on the creativity, you know, after eight o'clock when the kids are in bed. So, you know, all this, this normal, this environment you need for innovative research and for focusing on a research topic was really very hard for people with house calling or with a partner also in homework. Actually, the single, the single guys, they were pretty happy. So they reported that they could finally concentrate without going to meetings, without going to conferences, they were kind of appreciating uh, the, the situation. So we had a lot of uh, coaching um, offers for our uh, people, also for students about self-management, time disciplines, and so on and so on. So there were different things to do, and we, we, we really established those offers in order to make these things working. So now what we learned is um, that the infrastructure, of course, is one big issue. So you really do equip the people with an adequate infrastructure. But the next, the next most important uh, step is then to, to build up a social network, helping people in this situation. We definitely will um, critically reflect on the way we were teaching and cooperating and those things um, which went well, of course, we will keep, but there will be a lot of things we will try to get rid of again. Okay, well, you, I want to immediately spend 20 minutes asking about those, all those things you wanted to discard, but let me, let me, let us move on. I'd, I'd like to move us on to the next area of general discussion, which is so far, we've talked about how the university has reacted to basically a massive external shock, which has affected the whole world. And we've had a little sense of that in, in four institutions. Let's change the focus to ask a different question. What have universities contributed to um, our understanding of the pandemic, um, uh, our search for a vaccine? Um, just to give you the flavor of CEU, um, we're pretty good at network science. We're a tiny place compared to to um, uh, Berkeley and and uh, well to any of the institutions. We're a tiny place, but we're pretty good at network science. Martin Karsai and and Janos Kertes have, for example, studied information dynamics in China, looking at the ways in which uh, information flows and the timing of information flows tell us about how information spread during the pandemic. That's a very interesting subject. Martin Karzai has also been working modeling uh, the spread of the pandemic. Uh, the diffusion of a pandemic is a network effect. So we've been using our um, e expertise at, at uh, uh, network science at CU to make a tiny contribution, but there have been some huge contributions from these universities. I'm just wondering what what Carol and then perhaps uh, Louise could tell us about how the university has stepped up to try and contribute something to get us out of this terrible experience. Carol? Uh, thank you, Michael. I, I, um, I, I think that um, universities are going to emerge from this um, uh, pandemic with more of a sense of the importance of the work that they do simply because the work of universities has been so critical in um, both understanding the virus and uh, and developing therapeutics and, and, and a vaccine. I'm going to tell a, a, a short story. Uh, Jennifer Doudna, um, a member of our faculty, just won the Nobel Prize in chemistry. 
And when the pandemic struck, she called her entire, the entire laboratory, um, uh, the Institute, it's the uh, G Innovative Genomics Institute in which she works. She called them all together and she said, we have to rise up and fight this virus. And faculty, numerous faculty changed the focus of their research programs to work on therapeutics, to work on um, uh, you know, just understanding the virus. But what they also did was they created um, a, a robotic lab so that Berkeley developed the capacity to do its own testing of its community. We now um, uh, do 10,000 tests a week. Uh, students get tested twice a week who are on campus, uh, everybody else once a week. And uh, starting next week, they're gonna be sequencing all the positive tests so that we'll see that. So it's just you know extraordinary. We had graduate students um, uh, mixing up hand sanitizer and developing it to jails and to um, uh, homeless shelters. So, um, I, I, but I also think that we've seen a kind of increase in the audience for public programming. We would you know. Before the pandemic, we would have 60 or 70 people in a room or an auditorium listening to a program now, like on this call, we have hundreds. And we've tried to develop our programming through our research institutes and through the campus itself to address not only the, the, the science that um, is studying the pandemic and public health, but, um, but also the social impacts of the pandemic and its economic and, 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 and social consequences. Thank you, Carol. I, I wanna to go to uh, Louise next. I think everybody on this call will know that Oxford has played a crucial role in the development of one of the vaccines, the AstraZeneca vaccine. Uh, I think fewer people understand how, how important Oxford University as an institution was in shaping the pricing of the, the vaccine, the ways in which the revenues will be used to uh, promote research. Um, I'm wondering whether, Louise, you could just walk us through that story, because it seems to me tremendously important. Um, over to you, Louise. Thanks, Michael. Um, well, a very similar situation to the one described by Carol. Everybody simply down tools to see what they could do to help. But we have, um, we have a very large medical school, and we have international collaborators in, in Kenya, in Thailand, in um, uh, really across the world, but the main ones being in Cambodia, Thailand, and Kenya. Um, and they've been working on infectious diseases. So in January, the head of medical sciences came to me and said, two of our academics, not well-known academics, you know, we're, we all delight in Jennifer Goodner's extraordinary uh, stature. These are not well-known academics at all. He said, you know, they're working on a MERS vaccine and they really think it could work with the coronavirus one, but they have absolutely no money. Um, is there any way we could find a, a million pounds so that they could get this manufactured in uh, Italy to see if it works? Um, and we're a publicly funded institution and don't really have much money to, um, but we said, yes, let's, let's take a punt on this. Let's give them, let's find a million pounds for them. Um, on the basis that if it works, we'd get the money back from somewhere. So, uh, you know, we gave them the million pounds and it turned out this really worked. And within, within, um, 10 months, we have a vaccine that's, you know, 7 million people in Britain have received at this point. Um, but very early on, come March, we realized this might really work and we were completely out of our depth. We have a tiny little manufacturing facility, but if this was going to work, you know, we really need help. So we started talking to pharmaceutical companies who might manufacture and distribute this vaccine if it worked. Um, and so we had to find somebody who was prepared to manufacture it at risk. So I sat down with the academics and said, look, what's important to you? And they said, look, this is only, this is based on 20 years work in Africa, Thailand, and Cambodia. We need to make sure that those countries get access to the vaccine. We don't want our vaccine to be a vaccine for the rich. We don't want people making a profit out of this. So we said, right, when we started talking to companies, we have two conditions, which is, this has to be available at cost forever in the developing world, and it has to be available at cost for the duration of the pandemic. 
So as you can probably imagine, that rapidly reduced the number of pharmaceutical companies who were willing to talk to us. Uh, but we, uh, we made a deal with AstraZeneca. They accepted those conditions. Um, so, I mean, the, I would say we didn't want to be totally naive. Uh, most of you probably don't know, but actually Oxford developed pen penicillin right at the beginning of the Second World War. And uh, we simply handed uh, a couple of our academics who developed it, came over to America and basically gave it to the US government and US pharmaceutical companies who went on to make a fortune. So I thought, well, we can't make that mistake again um, because think of all the medical research would have been funded if we got some royalties. So we said, right, if this uh, vaccine works, if after the pandemic it becomes a, an annual vaccine and if there is revenue to be made for it, we will take a small cut of, from that, which will go back into uh, medical research. We want to create a new center for pandemic preparedness. So, um, so we have, um, I mean, it has, the world knows that it's been slightly rocky with AstraZeneca in a couple of places, but we're getting there. And uh, as I say, this, this vaccine, uh, unlike the others, it, I should say, we want as many vaccines as possible out there. But the great advantage of this one is that it's, it's very cheap to produce. It's very easy to store, to distribute. It really is a vaccine for the world. It doesn't require refrigeration and all the other things that uh, uh, to date the others need. So, so we're very proud of those academics, but they're by no means the only ones. We had other ac ac academics working on therapeutics. And again, it was our team who discovered that dexamethasone, which is again, a cheap $5 steroid and um, is really effective. It's the first known therapy for, for, um, for COVID. It reduces by 34% the deaths of people on ventilators. So this is, is a really critical intervention. We also have social scientists advising the government on um, what to do about anti-vaxxers, how to encourage people to wear masks. Um, so really the, across the university, people down to us and said, what can we do to help? Work together in a very collaborative way. Again, uh, created tests. We're all, we, had, we had our own testing facility too. Um, and we have evaluated for the government all the various rapid tests. So we, we've, um, you know, th this all happened in the middle of something called the REF, which is the Research Excellence Framework. Something happens every seven years in the UK and um, the deadline for which was December. So everybody up until that was completely focused on their REF returns. And instead they all said, forget the REF, and which is slight concern to me because that's our research funding for the next seven years, but uh, we just got to help with the national effort and, and that's what they've been doing. And, and it's been terrific. And as Carol says, I think at the end of this, we will have far greater appreciation for the value of uh, research universities, not least publicly funded ones, which have been called into question up until this. I think that's a fascinating story. And it, it's also an extremely important one because it says something about the power that a university and its research community can exert to achieve certain social benefits, namely um, the price of the vaccine, the, uh, the access rules for the vaccine, uh, making sure that if you've done 30 years of research in the developing world, you, you want to make sure that this vaccine benefits uh, those people. That's, I think, a, a pretty crucial story. Uh, universities, in other words, can shape the uses of science and the application of science to um, to important social goals. So it's a it's a fascinating story. I wanted to ask um, uh, Leon and Edeltraud also to come in on this and talk about the ways in which their universities have kind of contributed. I think one of the areas where Leon might have something to say is just what you do, how a, a university with the strength you have in uh, uh, music and performing arts has tried to help the performing arts and uh, cultural communities to survive what has been an absolutely devastating uh, crisis for that whole uh, world. Uh, Leon, have you got something to say about that? Sure, I want to want to say first of all that uh, I want to follow up on Louise and Carol. Uh, for institutions like ourselves, uh, one of the real problems since we've been through a traumatic crisis of a government that had no respect for science and for an internet world in which disinformation, non-information, 
pseudoscientific information. We actually have a role to play, I think, the universities, colleges, in trying to communicate uh, to the larger public how to understand this, the level of gap between what Oxford and, and Berkeley will do and the scientific literacy to understand, uh, for example, um, the exponential growth, right, uh, the nature of an epidemic, why social distancing is important, why masks are essential. I mean, this kind of conversation, which has become a frighteningly um, uh, anti-intellectual, uh, to put it bluntly, in the United States, and threatened the very foundation of democracies, we have to do something outside of the educational system as a public places where people can find out information and trust that information. So the translation of, of the discoveries or innovations uh, that can help us. Why vaccines? Why not vaccines? Why it's important that you be vaccinated? Why it's important that a critical mass of the total population gets vaccinated and so forth? So that's one very important public education. And uh, uh, especially through the school systems, but also to the general public. And I think universities have a role to play. The other thing that I was, uh, I, I thought of Louise's comment about the tutorials. One of the things, of course, that everybody knows is when you wear a mask, communication is, is compromised. Uh, facial expression, body language. Uh, you don't know whether someone is smiling or scowling, actually. And the reading of the eyes has become stronger. And we know that from group meetings, which are, a cat I think, a catastrophe on Zoom, you know, having a meeting where people are sitting around a proverbial table, the group function is very weak. And you pointed out about the arts. So, We've tried to help in creating uh, platforms, which are online innovative platforms for theater, dance and music, in which people can post what they're doing and we can help them organize it. Um, actually recitals in remote, you talk, you think this is odd, but imagine trying to do um, a Stravinsky duo uh, where one of the duos players is in uh, Hong Kong and the other one is in uh, California. Now, we were partly, we, we were uh, in a blended circumstance, we still are, where people on campus and off mixture. The dean of our conservatory, Tan Dunn, is in Shanghai. Um, and the director of the conservatory is here. And the young players are all over the world. Some of them are here. So they're, they're, we've tried to use as best we can the technology to give opportunity uh, for um, expression in theater and um, in, in music, it's very hard. But one of the things that's important is the, in the isolation the pandemic has created is in fact the absence of a public culture. You know, people, you know, uh, even they watch their movies on the screen by themselves. So um, uh, we, we have a role to play as public space in some general uh, and important way. Uh, and um, so we're not in the research business, but we're in the training and uh, uh, communication uh, business, if you will. And I hope in the United States particularly that the pandemic will have increased the number of young people who are interested in the study of science, and not only the translational, the practical, economic, mm -hmm. but many, many of the discoveries that um, are behind what uh, Carol and Louise described were done mm -hmm. by scientists who never thought there was any money to be made in this in the first place. Well, that's a good point to make. Um, I want to I want to shift us very quickly to uh, what we think um, the university is going to look like after the pandemic. But I'd just like to make sure that hear from Edeltraud as to what uh, has been going on at WU in terms of a a positive research response to uh, the pandemic crisis. Edeltraud. Yeah. Thank you. Well. Let me first put out there has not have not been only research uh, reactions, of course, to this uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, crisis. There were very small things we could do as a university. For instance, uh, as you know, there's uh, there there was this call center one four five zero where you always could call if you have any questions. And in a very very uh, short time, they um, they were overloaded and they had to train additional people. To, uh, to deliver the information. And what we did actually is we, uh, we provided uh, training spaces on the campus to do so. So they went there and they were, in a few weeks, they were training um, many people uh, to, um, to work in these call centers and under the emergency hotline 1450. So this was a very small thing we could do. 
Furthermore, um, one student came up and said, well, I have a school friend. He has a, he has a very small business and um, he needs a kind of, you know, um, a business through the, through the week. So we came up with a nice um, shared project on uh, ordering masks in, in the small enterprise and helping this, um, this small enterprise through, the, through uh, the crisis. So there were many, many small things our faculty or students came up with ideas how we could contribute on several on, on different different levels. Research related uh, topic, of course, we were a little bit jealous at the beginning because uh, whenever you would switch on TV, there would be some mathematicians or some guys from the medical school because these, these were the urgent topic. But very soon, of course, it became clear that it is and uh, this, this, this um, COVID-19 will have a huge impact on e economy and society. So um, we started an internal research funding system and we came up with 50 applications where people would try to uh, do research on various issues related to uh, COVID-19. So we had research on how is society changing in uh, times of crisis in terms of solidarity? Uh, what, what, um, how to create a certain, certain more certainty by communicating adequately? We had a huge project, an empirical project on the gender issues during home offices and how uh, this would impact, for instance, the career of uh, females. So there were many, many things coming up. And uh, I was very glad that also uh, VU is joining the Complexity Designs Hub, see you recently too, as I heard. And this is really an interdisciplinary group working on different um, models of the impacts of COVID-19. And I'm very happy that this is not only about having a mathematically great model, but really to, uh, uh, to have uh, input from the social sciences and from economics. So I'm pretty happy that this works out. Great, thank you all. Let, let's, let's shift to the, the, the actual title of this uh, gathering, which is the future of the university in a post-pandemic world. We're in the pandemic world. The post-pandemic world is in a weird way appears at the moment almost to be receding because of the proliferation of frightening new variants because of this death tolls that are still rising. We are definitely not out of this, but we can imagine um, being institutions which possibly as early as next academic year will be uh, in a different, uh, different reality, uh, a reality in which on-site teaching is possible, in which um, uh, we can potentially go back to where we were before. But what I wanted to ask, and I'll, I'll do the time zone sequence again, just when, when Carol, uh, you at Berkeley think about what your university will look like next September and a September after that and five years down the road, what do you think this experience will change about the way Berkeley teaches undergraduates, graduate students uh, in the future. I'd, I'd like to focus, if we can, on the teaching side, because I think that's of great particular concern, obviously, to the students watching the watching this uh, event. So I'll turn it over to you, Carol, with your thoughts about how you peer into the future, what you see as a as a leader at Berkeley. Well, I think that the university will be uh, permanently changed and, and in a good way. Uh, I've, I've had a number of faculty tell me they feel that they've discovered a muscle that they didn't know they had. And I don't think they're gonna forget they had that muscle after we go back to face-to-face -face instruction. I'm certainly not one of these utopians who thinks, you know, the university is gonna go entirely online. I think that the pandemic has taught us a lot about the value of face-to-face -face instruction, but there are things that are simply working better online. Berkeley has lots of very big lecture courses, more than a thousand students. Those are working better online. Um, flipping the classroom, creating kinds of breakout experiences for students is working better online. In addition, we'll be able to provide students a kind of elasticity of place. 
So in face to, when, when your only modality is face to face, everybody has to share the same physical place. But that makes a number of experiences, internships, for example, field work, um, uh, study abroad, all um, more challenging, whereas you will be able to have a mix of whatever you are doing in the place that you are and instruction available to you remotely. In addition, it's going to enable us to expand our reach. Um, uh, Berkeley has so many more applications than it can uh, uh, from students that it can possibly accommodate. And I look forward to some of our universities being able to grow because we don't have to make a space physically uh, for all students. We're already designing buildings differently. Um, we were uh, building a big data science building, which was gonna have a huge gargantuan lecture hall in it. We've scrapped those plans because we really do think those big in-person lectures are going to be a thing of the past. And we're also going to be able to extend our resources to many more students and also um, um, the public itself. Carol, you've raised a, there's a wonderful phrase there about elasticity of place. I hope we'll follow up on that insight. I, I also think you're saying in terms of expanding your reach that um, the new online technologies may do something about the inequality amplifier, the inequality issues that you seem to be picking up. Um, I'm wondering about, let, let's go to Leon next. What, what do you think the future of BARD will look like uh, a couple of years down the road as a result of this pandemic, Leon? No, I think, uh, picking up on Carol, the access and reach issue. Uh, technology will allow us to expand our reach. We have these um, eight um, early high school colleges which accelerate secondary school in the inner city. We'll do more of that. As uh, you know, we have this Open Society University Network that will allow us to have more instruction that brings students from different um, regions uh, together. Um, I think we'll change the kind of direct, direct contact. So following Louise's comment of tutorials, I think they'll, the blended aspect, meeting people in person and then online, uh, the kind of a intense gathering of groups and then dispersing them. I think a tremendous amount of flexibility, as uh, Carol said, the elasticity of access. I want to uh, point to one area that I predict will change, and that is the definition of curricula, particularly on the undergraduate level and perhaps on the graduate level, that some of the older inherited disciplines of the 19th century, some of the segmentation um, will crumble under the... Um, um, over-determined aspect of how one has to understand the pandemic, from the science to the distribution to the inequity questions, um, to the economic questions, to the impact. It seems to me that, um, uh, particularly for the humanities, uh, there is a, a sudden uh, new role in trying to uh, understand the human experience, its risks, uh, its history. And um, so, for example, we created an undergraduate uh, new course when the pandemic started for, for first year students and undergraduates, which is on the history, sociology and science of epidemics comparatively over various places. We changed, just changed the curriculum. Uh, we didn't think we we're going to do this the same way. And the kind of questions that young people uh, particularly uh, who are headed for university are going to ask, having experienced this, we have to face the fact that people who are not our students, not our faculty, but in fact future faculty and future students will have an important part of their biography. Um, the same way we had to face the veterans, for example, in the United States who came back from the, both the European and the Pacific theater, and they came to a study. And they, their attitude to learning was different from young people who had been coddled in normal, you know, agricultural or urban homes who didn't experience the confrontation with war. Um, so we have to pay attention to um, how we pursue the intellectual tradition after having survived this plague. I think that's a tremendous that, that I think it's tremendously important to in asking the question how will universities look in a post pandemic world we want to ask what will students be like in a post pandemic world given that this will have been a formative experience you know for my daughter she spent a year basically in 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 confinement and that changes I think a lot of things about her attitude I also think you're quite right about the the curriculum 
Uh, this will have very important effects on the segmentation, uh, the disciplinary segmentation. Louise, let me go to you and ask again this question. What, what is Oxford going to look like as a result of this? How are you going to change? What, what opportunities do you want to seize uh, that have been thrown up by the pandemic? And, and, and how do you see the university in a post-pandemic world? Well, I see us having a much more uh, popular, this may not be the right word, role within the state. Oxford, like Cambridge, has a particular role in British society, and uh, it is often seen as separate uh, for a whole variety of historical reasons. And I think given the very constructive role we've played, um, I think we will be um, uh, a much more popular institution within the country because of our role in COVID and because of the work we've done over the past few years in, in diversifying the uh, student body. Um, and that's really important as, a, as a, a publicly funded institution. I also think that because of the role of universities, we, um, we're going to put this anti-elitist populist notion behind us. It was a British cabinet minister in the run up to Brexit who said, uh, one, I'm embarrassed to say, educated by us, like so many of them are, who said, you yeah, know, we've had enough of experts. Um, and now the country cannot get enough of experts. So I think the relationship between especially research universities and the state will change. Most people think universities are places where 18 year olds go for a couple of years to grow up, but actually that's not how we see ourselves at all. And I think a broader understanding of what we do. As to the more focused on your response at the risk of seeing, appearing old fashioned, I, we're not going to abandon this um, highly personalized in-person education that we have uh, had for so long. We believe powerfully in, in community as an educational force in itself. Um, and I think especially for our undergraduate population, we will go back to having these very small tutorials within colleges, uh, colleges that are multidisciplinary, people of different backgrounds studying different subjects in a highly personalized way. It's an extraordinary privilege. It's absurdly expensive. One would never start a university. One could never afford to, to do that today. But because it is the holy grail for us and we will continue it. I think there will be a greater distinction between our graduate students and our undergraduates. Our graduate students are much more global. And there, I think the power of technology, we will expand. And um, we haven't grown our, we deliberately have not grown our undergraduate population. Our applications have gone up by orders of magnitude, but unlike other universities in Britain, we have not grown our undergraduate population precisely because we want to keep this highly personalized approach. I think we'd still want to protect that, but we have learned a lot about how to use technology. And we use that especially for our graduate students. Um, I think that's where it will have most impact in the way we do research and in the, in the graduate population. But the undergraduates, I suspect, will still be getting their very small group tutorials. Well said, well said. said. Um, uh, speaking for CU on this, I, just to pick up what Louise said, I, having been a classroom teacher as the happiest moments of my life, I've always thought of classroom teaching as very artisanal, very, you know, one table at a time, one student at a time, one life at a time. And I, I just think there's simply no substitute for it. I agree entirely with Carol. Chris, that in large, enrol large enrollment classes, large lectures, it may make a lot of sense to move some of that online, but the, the core encounter of the pedagogical experience, which is a teacher and a student learning together, seems to me to have been, the importance of that has been re-emphasized, re I think, by the, the, the COVID uh, experience, uh, certainly for me. I think you're also saying that the whole relationship between the university and the wider uh, world has been transformed by this experience. I think there's no question about that. Um, I think another thing that Carol, Chris said earlier, I made anxious note about because as some of you may know, CU is moving to Steinhoff, a beautiful uh, facility in five years. I think frankly, the pandemic will change how we design uh, those buildings. I think we will have to think very hard about what physical facilities we need in a post-pandemic world. Um, and, and that is exciting, but also 
um, slightly daunting. Let me go to uh, Edeltraud and, and ask her what she thinks WU will look like, uh, a great state institution in Austria and Europe will look like um, uh, after the pandemic. Edeltraud? Yes, thank you. I, maybe I, I'm, I might be a little bit provocative. So I love my auditorium maximum, even though we have those online features and we could easily trans, trans, transfer this to the pure online world. I would not underestimate the experience of our students when they come from their tiny classes from high school to be once in their life in this huge lecture rooms together with 300, 500, 600 people and have this, you know, this feeling of being a part of a community to have this kind of neighbors and chatting around, getting to, to know each other. So I wouldn't say that this is out. Definitely, I don't think that we will have a single course who would, which would be purely online. So because we always would hope that there are elements of interactions, of discussions, of, uh, you know, um, 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 discourses and so on, where people are really needed to sit down in one area and to talk to each other. On the same time, what I think what might be questioned uh, is, and this is I'm I'm constantly thinking over is what how is mobility changing? So if we take uh, now as as Louisa said, so we can bring together a lot of people from different institutions, different parts of the world, without you know transferring them, and the most most although many people would not couldn't afford to go to somewhere else to live there and to study there. So online features, of course, would allow. Um, different people to participate in the course. We are developing currently uh, actual international online courses together with partners to see how this works. And this works to some extent, but at the same time, um, international experiences is part of academic life. They can also into, taking also into consideration that we have the climate protection discussion and to say, the unnecessary mobility should, you know, should be limited, then of course I think there will be a new concept which I would call international exposure. And international exposure could include online meetings and online collaborations uh, of international students without meeting at a certain uh, point um, or at a certain campus. So basically I would say that as all the other colleagues of mine uh, argue that, of course, we still need in an academic sense, we need interaction, we need um, people to sit down and to discuss, to critically reflect on, uh, on various topics, and at the same time to develop empathy, to develop um, um, social skills. And this is not done online, actually. I mean, it's even, even we have this wonderful auditorium, it's still a strange feeling that you don't have a, 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 an, 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 an idea of, you know, about the, the atmosphere, about um, the, the, the climate in this group and so on and so on. So we, we lose a lot of things by online um, teaching and online discussion. Uh, discussions. Nevertheless, I'm, I'm really the, the, the most um, point I'm concerned about is how are we going to keep an international approach, approach and to maintain internationality uh, in times where we have been suffering from, um, from um, COVID-19, questioning mobility, questioning the need to meet on site. I think that's, an, that's a very important uh, problem that we all need to address, which is we've, we haven't simply gone through a global pandemic. We've gone through a world of closed borders. The whole internationalization, globalization of higher education has presumed um, visas, has presumed open borders, has presumed uh, travel. Um, we don't know what visa regimes, what... Um, um, uh, new restrictions may be added to the international travel system. And um, universities are among the most inter international institutions in the world. And uh, we simply don't know whether a re-sovereignized world, uh, that is a world where the borders have gone up again, 
will be as conducive to the internationalization of higher education as it was. We'll keep talking to each other around the world. Uh, Oxford academics will be talking to Berkeley academics, CEU academics will be talking around the world. But whether we can actually have the physical interactions we had prior to the pandemic, it seems to me is, a, is an open question because as I say, the borders have gone up everywhere and the visa controls and potentially uh, the necessity to have a, um, <clears throat> an inoculation passport when you travel. These are areas which may have a very strong impact on uh, higher education. I want to thank um, Carol Chris, Leon Botstein, Louise Richardson, Edel Traud, Hannah Pieger. I think everybody who's listened to this um, understands that we've been in the presence of unusually wise, calm, uh, and optimistic uh, university leaders. I, I also want to thank, there are still 150 plus people on the call. I want to thank each and every one of you for joining us tonight. I've recognized some faces. Uh, there have been some new friends uh, here, faculty, staff, and students. I want to thank each of you for being present at this discussion. Um, but uh, I hope we come out of this. I hope we all share um, Louise's optimism. I, I, I do think there's simply no question that this crisis has validated in a very dramatic way the importance of what universities do as teachers, as researchers, as learning communities. And I hope we come out into the night feeling uh, not that we don't have things to correct, not that we don't have things to do better, but what we're doing is extremely important. So thank you all. Good evening. Hope we see each other again. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Bye. Thanks, Ryan. Thank you. Michael. Bye.